Welcome back to the Coming Clean Podcast. I'm Stephen Perkins, and I feel like it's been a while since we've talked. It's really only been one episode, but regardless, great to be back with you. Um, this week, we're combining two of my favorite issues, which is education and workforce development. We're talking with Dr. Casey Sachs, who is the president at Bridge Valley Community and Technical College in West Virginia. And you may be thinking, West Virginia? They are leading on green tech, on, on clean energy, and she has such compelling stories to tell about the partnerships between their community and technical college and industry in the state. And so please enjoy this episode with Dr. Casey Sachs. Welcome to Coming Clean, the podcast dedicated to common sense environmental dialogue, environmental optimism, and real environmental solutions. This show is proudly powered by Orsted. Dr. Casey Sachs, thanks so much for coming on the show. How are you? Such a pleasure. Nice to see you, Stephen. I'm great. How about you? I'm doing well. It's uh, it's a busy season, but it seems like every season is becoming busy now. So a good problem to have. Um, I am really excited to have you on the show because... Uh, we're going to talk a lot about workforce development today, but I also think that the uh, the institution that you had as the president of Bridge Valley Community and Tech College in West Virginia um, is such an important institution. The type of uh, of, of of school um, and the projects that you're working on, um, I think, are really important when we talk about uh, our transition to uh, a green tech and green energy future. Um, but before we get into the meat of it, I, I first want to hear about you. Um, tell us about your background, how you got to this point. Um, you know, not asking for a resume dump, but you know, it kind of tell us what your experience have been uh, up into this point. Maybe in the last decade, I was working as the vice chancellor for the community college system here in West Virginia, and then I had the opportunity to go to D.C., where I served at the U.S. Department of Education in the last administration as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Community Colleges. So that portfolio includes mostly workforce development initiatives, but it's uh, commun not surprisingly community colleges. And it also includes career and technical education. So that's um, the federal Perkins grant that handles CTE activities for K-12 and higher ed. It's also prison education and adult education that's authorized through the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, or WIOA. Um, and so just a, a pretty solid background in some of the major federal acts that help fund workforce development programming and some of the philosophies that go into that. And then when I was finished in D.C., I had the opportunity to come back to West Virginia, where I've been serving as the president at Bridge Valley Community and Technical College. That's awesome. It's it, kind of a wild crossover that you mentioned CTE and Perkins funding. I was in DECA in high school, so I'm oh, very familiar with that. Great. Um, I credit DECA for being the reason that I'm in the positions that I'm in today. Like it was a, a, a really important part uh, of, of, my, uh, of my upbringing and certainly a lot of value in CTE. Um, but, but take a step back and tell us like, what got you interested in education in the first place? Did you always know that you wanted to be down that path or was that something that, you know, developed later? What's the background there? So I actually am trained as a clinical psychologist. And I was working as a therapist for older adults. Um, and my whole caseload at the time were people mostly in their 80s who had some version of depression. And we spent a lot of time with um, the sort of narrative that you might hear from someone who's 80 and depressed is I'm at the end of my life and, I have, and I'm depressed. And so I'm not having a, a great experience. And I've actually always been depressed. I've been depressed for 80 years. And so I've never lived a life that I've been happy with, and now I have to figure out how to die with dignity. And I would go home every day really sad. It felt really heavy, and it just wasn't great for my soul. And I have a lot of respect for the people who do that work every day, and I learned that I just couldn't be one of them. Um, and I had been a hall director in graduate school, and some of my students were depressed, but they were only 20. And so there was a lot more hope. And I. I thought, I kind of like that. I could go back and work at a college and have some of those same experiences. And so I interviewed um, for, for jobs all over the United States and ended up moving from Colorado to Philadelphia, where I was at Drexel University. 
and worked in residence life at Drexel. And actually, the reason I sort of ended up on a higher ed trajectory is that I started looking at people who worked at Drexel who had jobs that I would want to aspire to, and they all had doctorate. So I started looking at um, PhD programs and ended up going to Bowling Green, Ohio, where the state of Ohio was kind enough to pay for my PhD. Um, So it let me specialize in education finance and get a really solid grounding in how this industry works. Um, And it's been a great experience. That's awesome. And a a really cool story. And so essentially, it's like, you know, the 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 years in higher education can set people up for that fulfilling life but they they need someone who uh who can help put them on that path right like that's it, and i i think you see that a lot with youth today um depression rates are increasing and uh and i think with all the different externalities people are are you know there's there's a lot of external pressures there but we won't get into the depression point but i i think that's a really cool story um Tell us about your experience in the Trump administration working at Department of Education. Um, I I think for a lot of people, like many government departments, it's this massive bureaucracy, right? Um, But it is led by people who care. And and I I think that sometimes gets lost um, in in some of the rhetoric. Um, Tell us about your work there and 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 what you maybe what surprised you most while you oh were gosh, there. so much surprised me. I think one yeah. of the big learning i well, first, you're right. We have some incredible civil servants at the Department of Education, people who really do want to do the right thing, um overwhelmingly who want to work with the political staff and figure out how to execute the president's agenda. And I was really impressed by their professionalism. Um, it really a good group of people. Um, but so you learn so much going into a role like that. I had always worked in colleges and universities. And so stepping into the department, um, I think one of the, the biggest things I learned was that the United States Department of Education has very little to do with K-12 education, really yeah. doesn't even really fund K-12 education. There are title programs that help support schools for sure. But when you look even at a district's budget, it's very small percent comes from the United States Department of Education when you're talking about K-12. Um, and by design, the Constitution says that education is a state function. And so states should be funding it. States should be dealing with the policy for it. And, and largely, the United States Department of Education should not be involved with how states interact with their education departments. And so coming into the space thinking, what is it that my colleagues here are doing related to K-12 education? That was really a learning curve. There are some federal acts that do impact K-12 education, but the big function at US Ed is federal financial aid. They're running America's third largest bank with the financial Mm. aid system. You might actually want someone who has a finance background to be the secretary of education probably not a K-12 teacher. There's a lot more going on with finance in the country through that agency than there is with instruction, certainly with anything that you would think of has to, that has to do with sort of how are our kids learning in schools. That's not actually the function of the agency. And that was, I sort of knew that, but I don't think I really understood until I got sure. into the space and it was like, oh, we're running the bank. It turns out we should hire some bankers, maybe a few less teachers. Um, so that was a huge learning curve. And I was really lucky that I got to work with Betsy DeVos. She taught me a lot about charter schools and about school choice and helping families find the education that's right for their kids. Um, it inspired me to open a charter school since I returned to West Virginia, that there were opportunities that kids here just weren't getting. And I, I could see a really clear path forward. And so the college actually has a charter school for for kids in K-12 because of the influence that Secretary DeVos had on me. So that was um, a really fun thing to get to learn and interesting to see how we can give students and families different opportunities just by thinking through the system a little bit differently than maybe we have in the past. And so that, I would say, would be the second thing that I learned, that really it's a bank and also there's so many more things we can do for kids and families to make their learning environment better. So that's great sort of myth busting around uh, Department of Education and, uh, and, and really fascinating to hear. Let's myth bust West Virginia. 
uh, because it is it is a state that I, I think uh, incredibly underrated, um, often overlooked, and also has a lot of mis uh, uh, mistruths circling mm-hmm. about it. Right, I, I think that a lot of people will look at the state as just this rural state with an undereducated population, not a lot of economic development going on. But really, it is a it's a hotbed for a lot of activity right now. There's a lot going on in the state, and and as the uh, the the president of the college there, I'm sure you see it. So, paint a picture for us about what you've seen in West Virginia, um, and what might surprise our listeners to learn about the state right now. Um, gosh, there's so many things. Um. It's hard to know what the stereotypes are of something when you're sitting in it. So sure. it makes me need to reflect on your question a little bit. But I think um, one of the things that I've seen in West Virginia is that people here really want to work and really want to do a good job and want families to stay in West Virginia, want kids to see in West, stay in West Virginia. Yeah. It's one of the only states in the country um, without migration. We were bigger in terms of population in 1940 than we are today. And I think it's the only state in the country where that's true. Every other state has more people living in it today than they did in 1940. Um, And so some unique challenges in terms of demographics, the people who live in West Virginia tend to skew older. We have more retired people than young people. And so it creates some interesting tensions in the labor market. And at the same time, We have elected officials and a business environment that's been incredibly business friendly, really interested in getting companies into the space. Um, Some really interesting development going on. We have a clean, we have a battery technology plant, a stone's throw away from where I'm sitting right now. The biggest steel recycler in the country is moving into West Virginia right now and building a phenomenal facility. Um, There's a lot of manufacturing that goes on in the space. There's And manufacturing, I think, itself gets sort of a bad reputation, that there's a lot of stereotypes about it being dirty and unsafe and unclean. And it's really, if you go into any modern manufacturing facility, they have clean rooms. Mm -hmm. And they're, you could eat on the floor. They're creating biotechnology and technology that's getting inserted into your body during any kind of surgery. Or it's manufacturing itself is different. And so when I talk about manufacturing, I think it's layered stereotypes on a particular industry um, that need some myth busting all of their own. Um, But West Virginia is fantastic. We've got America's newest national park. The New River Gorge is here. There you go. Certainly worth a visit. Um, And the state is really interesting because it's within a 12 hour drive of almost three quarters of the population of America, of North America. Mm -hmm. And so what that means is in terms of a hub, for a business to think about, I have a product and I need to get it out to market. This is a really great location because getting it out to market from here could mean the Northeast and New York, and it could mean Chicago, and it could mean Florida. And that's all within a day. Um, And so we're really accessible in some ways that people don't necessarily think about for the state. Talk a little bit more about, um, and I know I, I now recognize the question was a big question, and I, I appreciate those answers. I'm, I'm sorry about that. But l- maybe let's drill down in on uh, uh, the state of higher education in West Virginia and the work that you do at your college, but but also what you see uh, across the, the um, not industry, but the higher education space in the state. Um, what have been your observations since being in this role? So West Virginia has more higher education institutions than we need for the number of people who live in the state. Um, Institutions per capita is something that higher ed as an industry should be looking at. Massachusetts is overbuilt. Um, Some of the Northeast, we've seen college closures. They've got more institutions of higher ed than they need for the number of people who are there. Um, Higher ed as as a generalization for the industry is used to serving 18 to 22 year olds. One of the things I've been incredibly proud about for the community colleges in West Virginia is we serve adults. My average age is 32. And when I look at my student population, I'm serving a 32 year old single mom who's trying to stop working in fast food and start working in a more family sustainable wage in a career that's really meaningful. 
Um, not to say that I don't serve men also, I do, but sort of my prototypical student mm-hmm. would be about like that. Um, that's not true for all of higher ed. And when you talk to presidents at institutions that are trying to serve 18 to 22 year olds, the birth rate started going down 25 years ago in, a, in North America. And so what we're seeing is a declining number of traditional age students who can fill empty seats. And so in higher ed news, our state flagships made national news a number of times in the last year or so because they've had to cut programs, they've had to cut services, because enrollment is 10,000 people fewer than they projected that it might be this year. That has some big implications for your budget when half of your revenue generally comes from tuition and fees. So our industry is certainly changing. Demographics are changing. And yet when I look at what needs to happen for workforce development, we have to find new ways to get adults into classrooms and into job training activities so that they can pivot and stop working in fast food and start working as a nurse or that they cannot have to worry about retail anymore and start being an advanced manufacturing technician. Um, and that one of the things I've been so proud about for my college is that we are good at that. We really love serving adults. It's it's the population we think about when we try and say, um, how do you get job skills? And what does that look like to be able to enter the labor market in some different ways? And, the, and Bridge Valley's been really good at that. So I swear we'll get to some of the green tech and, and workforce development here in a second. Uh, but th- th- so these are like two of one, you know, some of my top issues, workforce development and also education. Uh, my, my own mother uh, started her career from a community college and went on to become a nurse and all this stuff, like first in her family to go to college and, and, and even, um, you know, b- before she passed was, was working on a, on an advanced degree there. And so, uh, it, when when you compare you know community college or technical school versus university, um, obviously a huge cost saving to the individual student, um, and there there's a big debate right now about return on investment for a, a university or college or, or higher education. Right, um, just earlier this week, uh, a report coming out saying that there's there's uh, about thirty percent. Um, of these programs don't return a positive ROI for students in terms of degree programs. Um, that's not so much the case for community and tech college. And so talk a little bit about the importance of that with the full understanding that some people have, uh, again, maybe a myth-busting moment. Some people have negative views about a community college or a tech college, but in my opinion, they are um, not... Th- the number one and or not the only answer, but one of the top answers for solving this sort of ROI issue that we're talking about once people leave uh, school and get into the workforce. I completely agree with you. It's part of why I'm here. That community colleges, to your point, are a really good value. That when you look at the cost per credit hour compared to certainly any R1, but even any re- small regional four year, community colleges are a good deal. Um, and so a they, the co- community colleges can fill a few functions that in lots of communities, they're largely transfer institutions. So they're trying to set students up to think, maybe I do need a bachelor's degree for what jobs exist in this economy, but I could do two years of it at a less expensive price at a community college. So that's sort of one framework. But another that I think is far more important and not talked about enough is that workforce development function that the good community colleges are really thinking about what jobs exist in our area and how do I make sure you're prepared for those jobs. So here in the greater Charleston area in West Virginia, manufacturing technology is a is a big job and it's a good job. We're talking about, I mean, every single one of my students who graduated last May got hired right away by a local company. And the minimum, I, they're all making more than $80,000, but I think their average was ninety two. Um, Um. And so it's a two-year degree where students are stepping out immediately, making really good money Um, and tons of potential for promotion from there. So Toyota Motor Manufacturing has a big facility not far from here, and they hire a lot of people out of that AMT program. And I mean, it's one of, it's such a great example. They um, they commit to recruiting people into the program because not everyone understands what does it mean to come work for Toyota and what does that mean my job will be. So they help 
they say Toyota's hiring, but you have to go to Bridge Valley to get these jobs. So that's great for the pipeline. Um, but then they hire students while they're in the program because a lot of students can't afford to not work um, while they're going to school. And so Toyota has committed to paying students. They work at Toyota three days a week. They come to Bridge Valley two days a week. We have we structure all the classes around how Toyota needs them to be structured. And then when they graduate, they go work there. And then Toyota internally has committed to their workforce. If you want to go on and get your engineering degree, we want that. Keep working at Toyota and get your engineering degree. And so it's a great way. Um, you're going to take longer. It means that the college's uh, the way we get measured for our success is how long does it take students to graduate? So 100% okay. of time for an associate's degree is two years. Um, a lot, you, you'll see a metric that's what, how long did it take people to graduate at 150% of time? That sort of goes out the window when you're talking about students who then go on to work at Toyota. And it's by design. They sure. really want to work at Toyota. And in the next six or 10 years, they'll finish their degree and get to a the next level, but all along they're getting promoted at Toyota. And so it's a really great way, especially for somebody who has a family and who wants to live in the area and who wants to have a life, um, to not have to drop out of having a life so that you can go have this idyllic college experience that really, that is the thing that doesn't work for people. And when we talk about college not being ever, for everyone, I, I sort of disagree with the premise, but I think the reason I disagree is because the way I define college is so differently than how so many Americans define college. That for yeah. me, college is training, it's education, so you get these great workforce skills for things that actually exist in your community. And that's different than going to drink at a frat party. Sure. Um, you know, valuable on its own, but but yes, point point well taken. Sure. Um, so one of the things that also might surprise people about West Virginia and, and, and there's a direct tie in with the work that y'all do, um, is that they are, uh, leading on many, uh, the, the green transition, green energy, green tech, um, some of those pieces. Uh, in fact, um, y'all have a partnership with green power, which makes electric school buses. Um, tell us a little bit about that and how that partnership came to be and, and kind of the results that you're seeing there. So we have some amazing economic developers here in West Virginia. And when they recruit new companies into the area, they often bring executives to Bridge Valley to show them what we're doing, um, the kinds of facilities we have, the kinds of education that are happening on campus. So, so that any company who comes in gets some sense of, oh, they already sort of know how to do what we need. And then we have a commitment as a college to customize training to meet employers' needs. So when Green Power Motor came in, we said, what is it that you need? And they sort of put together um, some safety, some skills training, some of the blueprint reading, some of what happens in advanced manufacturing technology, some of the assembly and mechanical work. And so they looked at what we had sort of as a menu of offerings, and they said, we need these five things. So we put them together for Green Power into essentially what amounted to five modules so that they could rotate people in. Because when you come into a new area and you need to hire a couple hundred people, you start needing them trained, but you don't need all 200 trained on the same day on the same thing. And so what they actually needed were classes of about 15 who rotated through these modules so that they were more prepared when they were at the plant. Um, and so it meant that my team worked with Green Power to be able to figure out what's that sequencing look like. And they actually had a plant in Malaysia where they said, this is working really well and we like the training that we're doing for people who are in Malaysia, but we want to reshore to the United States. Can you help us with that? So we sent one of our faculty members to Malaysia to see what was going on that was so successful there so we could just replicate it. We figure if a company likes what they're doing somewhere else, that we don't want them to have to reinvent a wheel with us. We want to be sure. able to hit the ground running as much as possible. That's awesome. And, and also a great example of the, the types of partnerships that, uh, that, that, that companies can do with, with higher education. Um, because, uh, you know, I, I think sometimes that piece is missing and, and that's probably where we get some of this 30% of degree programs don't return an ROI is like, there isn't that level of integration. And, and the more that we can do that, the greater value we can provide to, to students. 
Well, and then um, it's really clear to Green Power, we want students who have this skill set and we know that we're getting what we want as opposed mm-hmm. to rolling the dice on somebody who maybe has a relevant or related degree, but maybe they don't have any of the safety training that I know they have to have. So I'm going to have to then retrain them once they've graduated from college anyway. If it's integrated and part of the hiring process, it's a lot easier for the business. (laughs) Right. Um, When it comes to the, uh, and and again, I'm I'm using this catch-all term of green jobs, but, you know, people who are going to go and work in spaces could be clean energy, could be uh, you know, manufacturing for for sort of sustainable products or the whole gauntlet of that. Is there an awareness issue in your mind that these opportunities exist, or do you find that um, that the people in your community they they know they're there uh, and they know the opportunities are there? Or I guess what's the big challenge of of getting people uh, into those jobs outside of just educating them? So. The elevator speech for what the job even is working as an advanced manufacturing technician, which is sort of my catch-all term for what that sort of probably means. Um, No one's ever heard of that. You've probably not met an advanced manufacturing technician. Your dad didn't do that. Your mom didn't do that. You don't know what one is. You don't. It takes me three or four minutes to even explain to you. Yeah. Here's your working environment, and here's the kinds of tasks you'll do every day. I'm recruiting students into my nursing program. Everyone knows what a nurse is. Sure. And so I think they sort of know the companies exist. When I talk about people in my community, I mean, you can't miss the Gestamp plant down the hill. It's gigantic. So you know it's there. You've driven past it. It's 80 million square feet. So you know it exists. But it's hard to think through, what would I be doing if I worked there? And and that is for sure a challenge. It's one of the reasons why we appreciate the Toyota relationship so much. And Nucor Steel, they've been wonderful. They go out to all of the local area schools and say, they spend the time with students. This is what the job is. Here's how much we pay you. Here's, Here's what we provide. Here's all the benefits that we have. I mean, they're selling their industry as much as anything. And so once they find a student who's sort of mathematically and mechanically inclined, then it then the conversation pivots to, you would be great for us. We'd love to hire you. You need some skills to be able to get here. And here's how you get the skills. And so it's been a great way to help communicate what that pipeline can look like. But I often, when I'm talking to adults, I just lead with wages. You know, you're really sick of making $20,000 a year. And the way that I know that you can make $80,000 a year in the next two years is by going into manufacturing or nursing. Huge. Yeah. And how early, obviously, the, you talked about the majority of your students are in that more adult population. But I, I do imagine there are some who come out of high school. And how early are you starting those conversations? Are you going into middle schools or, or junior highs? Or, or, you know, when do you find as an effective age to start? We do a lot of conversations with middle schoolers. We host a STEAM camp in the summer for middle, mostly middle schoolers, Um, some, a a few younger elementary school kids, but mostly middle school kids come to the STEAM camp. And it's really trying to get them exposed to what could careers look like, what's available in our community. And what I think has been so important and what I see so many community colleges do well is focus on the workforce in their community. So there's a few in Texas that I can name who are really working a lot on biotech. And it's because there's big biotech companies in those areas. So the more you talk about what what could you do and stay here um, is an important piece of the puzzle. That if if I tell you all about biotech, that could be great. And I want that for the United States. But it also means that you're probably not going to stay in the Charleston area. And so my role as an institution is, what are the jobs that exist in Charleston and how can I prepare you for those? Um, there are other institutions that talk about how do I get you to biotech, even if that's not here. Beautiful. Um, all interesting stuff. I'm sure a lot of people, it, it gives people some some food for thought here. I, I, I want to wrap up with some rapid fire questions, um, if that's all right with you. And, and the first one that I always like to ask people, um, and you just stayed in a new national park in West Virginia, but what is what are your favorite national parks or just a favorite place in nature for you? Um, 
Well, so we do have the newest national park here, the New River Gorge, and it's phenomenal. Um, but locally, I think we have some really great state parks. Babcock is probably on the top of my list. Um, and then growing up in Colorado, any of the any of the Rocky Mountains, people in the Denver area do a thing called climbing 14ers. There's a lot of 14,000 foot mountains out there. Um, and I would actually advocate for a 13er any day because the, there's fewer people. And to me, it's not that important that the mountain was 14,000 feet. What I want to do is go on a hike and I'd sure. rather not see anybody on my hike. So there you go. those would be up there. Beautiful. Um, a, a book recommendation. This could be something classic that you recommend over and over again or something new that you read, new and interesting. Uh, I what, love what the classics. I have um, I have Cats, Jane and Austen. So you maybe can start getting a sense of my genre. The, my dog's name is Emma. So maybe my go. book recommendation would be Emma. Perfect. Um, something that you are most excited about right now. Oh my gosh, so much. So um, I'm running for school board here because there's not a great alignment between our K-12 system and our higher ed system. And one of the reasons I opened a charter school was to help that alignment. And one of the things I've learned over the past few years is just how much more work could be done to help the community. So the election's Tuesday. I'm awfully excited about that. Well, that's awesome. Uh, I, I I think so. I think this episode probably drops after that, uh, but that's exciting. Best of luck to you. Thank you. Um, and we'll uh, we'll pay attention to the results there. Um, if you could put one message out into the world, big billboard, big Super Bowl ad, whatever it is, what's the one message that you would want people to hear? Something about going to work. <laughs> it really can change your family. It can change your community. Uh, it's, it is, there's so much dignity in work. And when I see families that come in that don't have access to that, or when I go into elementary schools and hear kids tell me that they just want to collect a check because that's what their mom does, it sort of breaks my heart. Okay. And so my billboard would be something about work and how important it is to be able to really cha truly change your life. Beautiful. Uh, and finally, any sort of action item for our audience, maybe something to to think about, something to do, or just a request that you might have of our audience? Yeah, please tell people in your families about community colleges. You have some real gems right in your area. And I think to your earlier point, people sometimes um, get caught in a trap of thinking that they need to go to the place where the football team is. And I would really challenge you, if, especially if you know what you want to do. Um, it's a really great way to get an education and to help people in your scope of influence understand that. Dr. Casey Sachs, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's such a pleasure. Thanks so much for tuning in again to the Coming Clean podcast. You can find ACC at ACC underscore national on Twitter and Instagram. You can find us on Facebook. You can also, if you really enjoy our work, you can go to donate.acc.eco slash coming clean, and you could drop us a dollar or two if you feel inclined. In the meantime, a free way of supporting us is to like, subscribe, leave a rating for our podcast wherever you get your podcast, um, and also subscribing means that you'll never miss an episode. Until next time, take care. We'll talk soon. And before we jump, the Coming Clean podcast is grateful to be powered by Orsted, a wonderful company strengthening America's energy security with reliable and domestic clean energy. Through its integrated renewable energy solutions, Orsted is creating American jobs, investing in American communities, and driving American innovation, all while preserving our country's natural habitats. A clean energy future truly connects us all, and Orsted is helping lead the charge. To learn more, visit us.orsted.com.